If you are under the impression that the technological revolution that's been overhauling our lives for the past two decades is finally settling in to a period of normalization, well, our next guest has news for you. This is only the beginning, according to author Kevin Kelly, who lays it all out in his new book. It's called The Inevitable, Understanding the 12 Technological Forces That Will Shape Our Future. Kevin Kelly is co-founder and senior maverick at Wired Magazine, and he joins us now on the line from San Francisco, California, where it is good to see your face again. Kevin Kelly, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's a wonderful, beautiful, sunny day here, a real exception. A, a real exception, I'm sure. Let's, um, at the risk of dating us both, because you were here 21 years ago, and I want to just share with our viewers and you uh, what we talked about and what we looked like 21 years ago. <laughs> Roll tape, please. The bet you made suggested that by the year 2020, there will be two very different visions of the future. And the pessimist that you were debating in the pages of Wired said, all of the major currencies of the world are gonna go into the toilet. The poor are gonna rise up and revolt as never before. Not just the poor within this society, but all of the poor nations around the world will rise up. And this planet is going to be a god awful mess. Right. And you bet him a thousand bucks that he'd be wrong. Right. So tell me if that's not what the future's like, how you're going to collect on your bet because the future is in fact going to be what? Well, I propose the future is a world in which our technology is in many ways like the organic nature that we have around us, that there's um, things that replicate and heal themselves. They don't need a lot of babysitting from us. You have a room in which everything in the room has a little sliver of smartness in it and it's communicating to each other so that we have basically an ecology of machines. We have factories that are very adaptable that can um, change and produce things in units of one personalized for you. We have industrial processes that are much run much safer at the speed that biological organisms operate so that they are safer for those who work with them. All in all, we are moving our technology towards bi biology, which is the ultimate technology. Okay, first of all, I like the beard. Second of all, you look way better now. <laughs> Third of all, I want to know whether or not you think, because you did say a quarter century, so we're coming up on that in four years. Uh, who's more likely to collect on that bet these days? You know, I, I'm willing to uh, double or nothing with Kirk Sale, who I made the bet with, even though there's only four years. Um, and he could still be right. <laughs> Everything could collapse. We could have uh, Armageddon, uh, ecological disaster, and you know, worldwide plague. That's possible, but it seems to me very unlikely. So I'm willing to actually double or nothing to bet. Do you think people are more or less optimistic about the prospects for our planet today than they were 20 years ago when we had that conversation? I think, on average, people are a lot more pessimistic, even though the reality is that, that we're actually better off. This is a really weird disjunction right now between the actual statistics, if you look at the, uh, the measurements of what we really find valuable, they're all going up, yet there is a kind of a widespread feeling that, that things are worse off now. And how do you account for that? Hollywood. I think it's much easier to imagine uh, things going wrong than it is to imagine how we could possibly have a world in which tracking is ubiquitous, AI is ubiquitous, VR is ubiquitous, all this stuff continues to expand, and we're happy. It, it, we, we're having trouble imagining how that works, and therefore the alternative of where it collapse, the, the robots rise up and they kill us all, that seems to me to, to, to be a little bit more believable. From everything I've read, the, the facts actually support what you're saying, with one significant exception, which is most people seem to think their kids aren't going to do as well as they have. That's fairly right. telling, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. It is a real sign of the pessimism that I think is widespread. And I think, um, you know, during the, during the heyday of science fiction in the 50s, there were all these very positive futures. And if you ask a lot of people today working in technology what the source of their inspiration was, it was often a science fiction movie like Star Trek or the, or the you know, the technology in, say, Star Wars. And I think um, there is, in a certain uh, respect, uh, an obligation of the people making scenarios, writing science fiction, to try and work a little harder at making a positive view of the future. Because I really do think that we need to have this vision, a positive vision, in order to make it real. I think, in fact, if I've got this right, you said you caught a bad dose of optimism in Asia while you were traveling through there in your 20s. And I wonder how, this many decades later, you still have not seemed to have lost that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I know, it's only gotten worse. Um, I think uh, my optimism comes from becoming a student of history. I mean, I think if you, the best way to, to be optimistic about the future is turn around and be really real about what has been in the past, what our lives are like even 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or you know, travel like I do an awful lot into the developing uh, world and uh, see the, the, the lives of people who don't have technology. And then you become an optimist about where we are going because we, you can see very clearly that more technology actually helps our lives become better. Well, we did in fact talk about this, of course, 20 year plus years ago. Yeah. We talked about the notion of our jobs being digitized or globalized away. So let's go back down memory lane from two decades ago and then we'll chat again. Sheldon, roll the clip, please. Technology, particularly this computerized technology, is taking away some of the things that we used to do. So and we no longer have to weave clothes because machines can weave it much better than we do. We have little pocket calculators that can do arithmetic much better than we can ever do in our minds. They're just not made to do arithmetic. And so we're left with this question, what are we going to do? What's good for us? If these machines are doing all this stuff, what are humans for? Do we have a better answer for that today than we did 21 years ago? I think I have a better answer. I can't speak for everybody else, but I think um, it's very clear that anything that we want done that can be measured in terms of efficiency or productivity, whether that's physical or intellectual, is going to be moved to the bots. You know, robots are really good at productivity, but productivity is really perfect for bots. A lot of the jobs that we're fighting over right now are really jobs that should, humans should not be doing at all, and we'll be embarrassed in 100 years that humans ever did them. I think what our jobs become is the kinds of jobs where inefficiency is uh, a mark. For instance, science. Science is a job that's just built on, one, on failures. Uh, innovation, by definition, is built on accumulating a lot of failed attempts. Uh, experience is not measured in productivity or efficiency. Art isn't. So we, we're going to move our, our, our own lives in general towards those kinds of tasks that can't and shouldn't be measured in terms of efficiency and productivity because they involve a lot of a wastage, because they involve a lot of experiences, because they involve things that aren't being measured in productivity. We do, though, I think, still live in a society where most people still like the notion of having a decently paid full-time job. That's yes. not going away, is it? No, it isn't. And I think a lot, a lot of jobs are really a whole bundle of different tasks. And a lot of the tasks are going to be automated through robots and AI, which kind of transforms the job. And that doesn't necessarily take the job away. It, it just transforms it. So a lot of the tasks are going to be done by AIs. And I think uh, we're going to be paid, say, in 20 years from now, by how well we work with the AI and robots because they're going to be our partners. We're going, to, they're, they're going to, we're going to be working with them rather than against them. Let's, uh, I want to take a leap into the far edges of the future here. We're going to do an excerpt from your most recent book, The Inevitable, and here we go. Thousands of years from now, you write, when historians review the past, our ancient time here at the beginning of the third millennium will be seen as an amazing moment. This is the time when inhabitants of this planet first link themselves together into one very large thing, Later, the very large thing would become even larger, but you and I are alive at the very moment when it first awoke. Future people will envy us, wishing they could have witnessed the birth we saw. Okay, we've got to pull that apart a bit and figure out what that means there. <laughs> the, the very large thing that people in yeah. the future uh, mm. wish they would have been there for the right, dawn right. of. What are you referring to? Well, so, so it's very clear that in the last couple of decades, we have sort of connected ourselves together, all the, the people on the planet on Facebook, you know, 1.5 billion people are connected together, sharing things on Facebook. So we've begun this process of connecting all the humans uh, live at some point in their lives and more and more, more and, and more of their life together. And at the same time, we're connecting all the machines that are connected together, our little phones, our laptops, the servers that run our businesses, they're all being connected on this cloud, and then eventually we'll have the inter-cloud, the cloud of the clouds. And that whole thing, the, all those machines connected together and all the humans connected together will be connected into this holos, this very large machine or organism or super organism of all of us connected to each other, humans and machines and AIs, in something that 
we don't have a name for and we don't really have a good concept, but that is the thing I'm talking about. And there'll be emergent, weird, higher level phenomena, behavior that comes out of this bundle of all of us connected to all our machines and all of us together. And that thing, planetary in scale, is really something new on the planet. And that's the thing that we are in the very beginning, day one of, of, the, of its birth right now. Well, you say it doesn't have a name, but you do name it in your book. You call it, as you just said, the HOLOS, H-O-L-O-S. Where, where does that come from? HOLOS is a, I hate coining names because most of them don't ever work, but I'm, I'm kind of desperate to come up with a handle on, on uh, to call this. There's been other terms like the new sphere, which was the, myst the French mystic priest who imagined this uh, thing that was a little bit more of um, the, the collective thought. It didn't include the machines. There's H.G. Uh, Wells, the great science fiction writer, had the world brain, but that didn't really include us. We have the word Gaia, which is the kind of a whole earth, but it's mostly the, the, the natural sphere rather than the technological. So I use the word holos, which is like whole, very similar to the holistic, the whole thing, and to, to, to describe this thing, which is the entire planet, natural planet, plus the technological planet, plus the human side, these three elements make this new organism or superorganism that we're making on a planet that, that over time we'll, we'll, we'll understand it's not just a metaphor, it's a real thing that will have its real behaviors and its real dynamics and will really affect us. Now, because you're such an optimist about the future of uh, people and the planet, you see this as a potentially beautiful thing, uh, but you're also a Star Trek fan, so I know that you know what the Borg are. And sometimes <laughs> when this convergence, at right. least in Gene Roddenberry's world, comes together, uh, the Borg is a different kind of a future, which is really quite appalling. How are you, right. how are you so convinced that this new hive, whatever it ends up being called, right. is going to be good for us? Yeah. So, um, I... I I'm not a utopian. I'm a protopian, meaning that I believe that, that every step we take is a step of better, betterment, but that we never arrive at this sort of perfect world. And therefore, this world that I'm describing will have huge downsides. I think that most of the problems we have today are actually been caused by the technology of yesterday, and also that tomorrow, in the future, most of the problems we will have will be caused by the technology we're making today. So I think Technology creates almost as many problems as it creates solutions, but that the response to the problems that technology makes is not less technology, but more technology, or I should say, better technology. So I think there was going to be, you know, there could be almost 49% really bad stuff made with this uh, emergent holos, but there'll be 51% good. So that 2% delta is all that we need compounded over time to make civilization. And so, and, and then that's, again, I get that from the historical review, is that we're able to make 51%, 2% more, we can create 2% more than we destroy every year. And that 2%, it's a, not very much, it's very small. And it, it almost disappears to some people because you're, they're saying almost half of the world is bad, it's crap. But 2% delta, is all that we need to make civilization go forward. And I think that's maybe all that we have. And my optimism rests on that 2%. Hmm. I'm also intrigued to learn more about how you see the internet changing. And I think you describe it as moving from an internet of information to an internet of experiences. Tell us what you mean yeah. by that. Well, I think um, we've had an internet of information. So the, you know, the Wikipedias, you know, your files, your photographs are all information based. And that's been this marvelous thing that we've constructed in only uh, about 9,000 days. I mean, the entire web is only 9,000 days old. We've made all this amazing stuff, street maps to the world, and most of it for free. It's kind of a marvelous miracle. But it's, but it's all information-based. I think where we're headed next, with the advent of both VR, virtual reality, which you can put on these goggles, uh, and AI, um, is, is moving to, to a, a moment where we actually experience things, not just know them. That's one of the amazing tricks that virtual reality has done that I kind of experienced in my research in the last five months, is that 
You can feel things rather than just see them or know them. Because there's some trick that happens when you put these glasses on and you hear the sound and you have these fake things that you feel, you feel them in a different part of your brain than you, than you observe them. And that what you're getting, what the currency is, is experiences. And so when we download these VR things, we'll download experiences. When we share, we'll share experiences. And the presence of some other person is something that we experience, even though they're not there, and rather than just see them. And so I think with this VR, with AI behind the VR, we're going to be able to move into an a, a internet, a, to a network of things that we experience and share. Experiences become the new currency. And I think that's a whole transformative leap, step function in what we've had so far. So if you want to think about what does the internet look like in another 20 years, it's going to be an internet of experiences. Hmm. And once again, from your book, you write about the future. One will be able to sell only that which cannot be copied. Mm. But I wonder now, with 3D printing, where you can pretty much make a copy of anything that's out there right now, what's left that can't be copied that would be of economic or interest, interesting yeah. value to you? Yeah. So, so the premise is, is that you know the, the, the thing, the internet, want, is the largest copy machine in the world. That anything that can be copied, if it touches the internet, it's going to be copied. You can't stop the copying because it's inherently built into the physics of the internet. And so all the attempts to try to stop copying doesn't really work, but at the same time, it makes things that are copyable worthless because you can get them for free. So what do you sell? Well, you can sell things that can't be copied easily and things like immediacy, say. So let's say if I want a, a piece of music, I could find a piece of music eventually on the internet for free. But if I'm willing to, if I really, really want it right now, as soon as it's been created by the, my favorite band, I might be willing to pay for that music. But because I could find the music for free elsewhere, I'm not really paying for the music. I'm paying for the immediacy of the music. The band is really selling immediacy rather than the music itself. And the same thing, say, with personalization. If I got the same kind of music, I could find it. But if I wanted that music to be acoustically tailored to my living room, that personalization I'm willing to pay for, I'm not really paying for the copy of the music, which is going to be copied, I'm paying for this very, very specific thing that's just for me, and so I'm really paying for the personalization rather than for the music. Hmm. You know, I do have to give you credit because when you call a book The Inevitable, you are putting a big fat target on your back, of course, Yes. Uh, and you are actually humble enough in the book to acknowledge the fact that by saying this is inevitable, um, you know, it's a bit of a heavy thing to do. But having said that, why are you so sure that that which you are forecasting is in effect, inevitable. Yeah, so, so, so there's, there's a couple of, of uses of the word inevitable, and there's a very strong version of it which says that, um, if we, this is the Stephen, Joel, uh, St Stephen J. Gould's, uh, the evolutionary biologist, his thought experiment. If you go back and rewind the tape, we go back to the beginning and start over, that each time we do this, and we run it for you know, thousands of years, we'll come up with where we are right now so that we'll have the internet and we'll have Twitter and Snapchat. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's inevitable in that strong way. I'm saying that if we rewind it, we'll have an internet again. So the internet is inevitable, probably on any planet in any galaxy that they invent electricity, they'll eventually make the internet. But Twitter and Snapchat are not inevitable. The, you know, the, the specifics are not. The larger forms are almost like developmental in the sense that you progress through. So in your own development, it was inevitable that you were you know, um, uh, an embryo, a fetus, an infant, a newborn, an infant, a toddler, and eventually a teenager. You didn't have any choice in being a teenager. That was something that was an inevitable development, but you had a lot of choice about what kind of teenager you were. And the same thing with the internet is that the internet's inevitable, but the character of it, how, whether it's international, national, open or closed, commercial or not, those are choices that we have. And so, these large forms, the reason why I believe they're, that they're inevitable is because I'm looking and asking at the technology and saying, what does it want? And also because they've already been operating for almost a decade. 
So the trends that I'm talking about are kind of buried in deep into the character of the physics of this, and we've seen them for all, at least a decade, and everything about them in the large form are going to continue. The specifics are completely unpredictable. I guess one of the other things, though, that you say is inevitable is the pushback that will come with a yes. world that where it's 51-49, as you point out, and you're banking right. on the 2% delta that's going to get us to where you think we ought to go. How do you right. imagine that, that pushback to, to the future you've outlined, what do you imagine that to look like? Trump is, I, mean, I hate <laughs> to say it, but it'll, I mean, those jobs that, that, that people are feeling the, the, the real pain of having lost, they're, they're, they've been lost primarily through, through technology, through automation. They, it wasn't, it's not about China, it's not about Mexico, it's about the fact that we have taken a lot of the work that was done by humans and we have moved it to machines. And so um, that, th there's, a, there's a lot of disruption, a lot of conflict. Uh, th there's going to be a lot of temporary um, pain in, in real people's lives and real families' lives due to the fact that we're moving. And that pain will continue when AI and artificial intelligence begins to seep into white collar work as well. And mortgage, uh, diagnosing x-rays, these are all things that humans do that actually AI does better. And so I think we're not at the end at all of seeing this kind of uh, relocation and um, unease and uncomfort and actually frustration at the kinds of things that are coming. But I also know that 150 years ago, 70% of all Americans were farmers. And if you had told them that in another century, all their jobs would be gone, except for a very few 1%, they would say, what in the world would I be doing? And you'd say, web designer, you'd be you know, a ballerina, yoga coach. That would be completely nonsense to them. And I think the same way the jobs that we're making, the technology makes more jobs than it takes away because we have new possibilities, new things to do, that we're actually gonna create more jobs than we are going to take away. It's a matter of moving people into these new jobs. And they're not all just cerebral jobs. I mentioned we're moving to the internet of experiences. A lot of, of what we want is interpersonal relationships. And so there's jobs in um, like coaching, uh, yoga teaching, um, nursing, being, being at the bedside. These are things that we want from humans that robots are not gonna do, um, that, uh, that we cherish, and we pay more for experiences. Experiences is the only thing going up in price. All commodities go down. So we're willing to, to pay money for these kinds of jobs that humans are good at. Are you sure the majority of Americans are ready for the kind of future that you have described? No, I don't think they're ready, and this is why I wrote the book, The Inevitable, is, is, is to say and, and to try to, to convince them that these technologies like tracking, like AI, artificial intelligence, like virtual reality, like sharing, like all the time we spend screening, are coming, and that we need to embrace them in order to manage them to make them better. We, we, can't, we, we can't manage them by prohibiting trying to stop them. That's just not going to work. They're going to come. And so we need to embrace them to actually maximize their benefits and minimize the harms. And it's only in that embrace, it's only by using them that we actually get to, to change technology. Hmm. We cannot change it by trying to turn it off, stop it, turn it away, outlaw it, and many other uh, attempts at this, you know, to send it overseas, whatever it is. No, no, we have to, it's coming, we have to embrace it, and if we can embrace it, then we can work with it, we can have it change our lives, we can change our education, we can do all the things we can. But imagine, pretending that it's going to stop, it's just not going to work. Hmm. Uh, it, it, this may be a perfectly ridiculous question to finish up on, but, but since, Kevin, I think you really are, uh, I mean, if anybody knows, you know, so I'm going to put the question to you. If we were to have this conversation, you and I, or our essences, Mm. which may remain a thousand years from now, uh, will there be any nature left, physical or natural, no. uh, physical or human? Yeah. What's left? Yeah, so the, in among the many bits of good news that I get buried is the fact that actually the environmental news is actually getting better despite the fact of, of the headlines in the sense that um, the uh, um, 
the, 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 except for the except for global warming, except for the, the climate, many of the other aspects in terms of number of species, um, the, the, uh, uh, pollution decreasing, um, with exceptions here and there around the planet, on average, things are getting much better. And the 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 idea that we're actually tearing the earth apart is actually not correct. We have a lot of problems. A lot of uh, the issues of global uh, climate change are real, and we need to have uh, the solutions have to be at the global level. But many aspects of, of this um, forest regrowth, uh, species uh, rebound, are actually good news. And they're lost in a lot of the headlines. And so I would say absolutely that the future is, is that we will continue to, to migrate into the cities uh, and there'll be less and less damage to nature overall as we actually make our cities, which are the most efficient way for us to live. And the, and the, and the, the smallest footprint, the smallest eco footprint is, is having a very strong urban areas and letting nature as much as possible recover. And I think that's where we're gonna go and that was where we'll be in a thousand years. Hmm. Uh, Kevin Kelly, the book is called The Inevitable Understanding the 12 Technological Forces That Will Shape Our Future. Uh, let's not wait 21 years to have another conversation, sir. It's great to have you on TVO again tonight. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're recording because I'm sure in 28 years from now, we'll play it again. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.